Park in the Black Center of Dartmouth. Parsons um, rushed the Institute of Technology and Teachers College um, and uh, with funding provided for specifically by uh, Microsoft Research. And the goal for this uh, interdisciplinary institute is to look at the educational potential of games and to identify design patterns that make those games educationally effective. And um, so we thought who better to invite to um, one of our or the inaugural part of the uh, Institute's uh, uh, curriculum series and uh, Jim G who has been uh, uh, known in the field as uh, one of the uh, great uh, contributors to our understanding of current games and learning. Uh, Jim is a member of the National Academy of Education, and uh, what some of you may know, but perhaps others uh, do not, is that he has an entirely different career as a, as a linguist and uh, has written in 1990 a book on social linguistics and literacy, which founded a whole new area of literacy studies that looks at language and uh, learning and literacy in an integrated way uh, by taking into account the um, full range of cognitive and cultural and uh, social context. And, and he's uh, written a book on discourse analysis and just told me that he's thinking of uh, writing another one too on the same topic um, that uh, uh, looks at uh, communication and cultural settings and providing methodologies to uh, investigate that. Um, more known for, for this audience perhaps are his books on uh, games and learning and uh, the first groundbreaking book on this was where video games have teaching about learning and literacy that came out in 2004 and it's been effective now. Uh, then there is another one situated thanks and learning and then with video games and good learning collected essays that came out in 2007. So um, distributed on not just in books but also uh, a speaker at uh, all the important conferences uh, published in, in uh, uh, all the important journals. It's a, it's a really outspoken advocate for uh, games and learning and shows how uh, the learning principles are embodied in games. Uh, that's uh, the theme that he's using that uh, uh, makes this work so exciting. Uh, today he's going to talk about uh, games in the 21st century and um, what is um, the, the connection that we see between uh, what he's doing and what we're doing um, in, in our institute bringing together computer scientists and game designers and education research on the other side is something that he talked about in his book. And I just wanted to read a very brief passage to you where he says, game design as an enterprise is at a deep level similar to education seen as a design science. Uh, how good game designers think about game design, we believe, has much to teach us about how educators also think about the design of learning in and out of classrooms. And that's more or less the theme for our institute. We're very excited to have uh, Jim G here tonight uh, today in, in, this, in this event uh, that's co-sponsored by the Institute for Games for Learning, as well as the ECT program at Steinhardt and uh, SUNY Black Center um, and uh, the Black Center Institute, so on that program, IDS. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, uh, it was difficult to prepare this talk because, uh, you know, this is a this is kind of a new audience. When I started in this stuff, you know, uh, you spoke a lot of times to audiences that didn't know much about it. Now that's changed, and you're speaking to audiences who know a lot about it, and uh, soon they'll know a lot more than me about it. So that'll be over. Uh, but you know, when I started this enterprise, uh, my original book was not about bringing games to school, although that was often written. If you actually read the book, it's about bringing the type of learning games do to school, whether you do a game or not. Uh, but in the interim, an industry has cropped up that does want to bring games to school. And we're at a, a kind of dividing point, I think, in a, in a lot of that stuff about what we're going to do with games in school. And the dividing point is kind of this. We can either make games that do school as we already do it. You know, basically the games that teach facts or do skill and drill, or which our current school system does, and, and we can make games to facilitate more of what we're already doing. And I, I would say that's a large part of the industry. Or we can make games that are actually going to introduce 21st century learning and break the mold of our schools. Uh, and uh, we're really at a divide of which we're going to do, and there's people who have big disagreements. Some of it is just about money, of course, I mean, how you make money, but others is about, really about people's commitments. Now, in the latter part, that is trying to make games, trying to leverage games for, to, for 21st century learning, they, in my opinion, those games can't be used in schools as we currently have them. Right? They, they absolutely require the school to change. And that's what I like about them, because they, they are simultaneously an offer of the, for the 21st century and they're a challenge uh, to schooling. But this is a choice anybody in this industry is going to have to make. 
All right, so let me think a minute about what is really going on in school. This slide is meant to capture part of that. You know, uh, you know, school involves, as far as I'm concerned, sort of four things, one of which we never talk about, though it's the very center of our schools, what I'll call articulation. You know, we have teaching, learning, and assessment, and teaching in school is typically instructing somebody. That's what a teacher does. And learning is typically about content or facts. It's what we test on our bubble tests. And assessment is done after people learn. And really, at the center of schooling is a thing that I call articulation. That is, can you write down your knowledge? Or can you say it? And what do you get with this type of schooling? And we know this from lots of research. We've known it since the 70s, is you get people at best who can write down their knowledge, because that's the center of your schooling, but they can't solve any problems with it. So for example, since the 70s, there's been studies like this one that you ask kids taking a physics class, even ones that have an A in physics, how many forces are acting on a coin when you throw it in the air? And 75% of the people get it wrong. And you can deduce the answer from Newton's laws of motion. And they can all write Newton's laws down. But they can't actually use it to apply it to the world. Uh, and by the end, in that study, by the end of the course, 50% of the people still got it wrong. And this was a civil engineering course. They built bridges. So you'd never go over a bridge if you really had seen this study. So you know, that, the, the, the trouble is with this form of schooling, where you stress articulation and not problem solving, what you end up with is people who can't solve problems, but who can pass tests. Now, I'm going to, of course, suggest to you that game-like learning, if done in the right way, is very, very different than this. So let's take it. How many people played Portal? Okay, this is a fabulous, wonderful, terrific game. Uh, but Portal teaches us something interesting about games. I mean, a, a thing that I uh, want to say is a general principle and a, a, that leads us to a way of talking about games. And that is this, is that Portal, like many games, is very good at problem solving. See, what's at the center of games is not articulating your knowledge. It's solving problems. So it, when you play Portal, for the pure fun of it, you actually solve problems using physics in the world of that game. Right? So for example, if you played, you know that you have to catch on to, in that world, uh, the, the physical law of conservation momentum applies. You, you will go in one portal as fast as you go, you know, it, however fast you go in one, that's the speed you come out the other. And you use that throughout the game to judge how far you can go, plus some you know, angular momentum and the angles that gravity operates by in the game. And you, you solve problems with that, simply playing with uh, physics. I mean, you know, here's a level in which you can solve in many different ways. Uh, I did portal. You know, this is a game, if you haven't played it, where you can only do one, a few things. You make an orange portal or a blue portal. And you, if you go in one, you come out the other. And you have to get through all these laboratory spaces where later you find out they're trying to kill you. Um, and you have to solve these problems. And they're taunting you and saying, you're really stupid. You're too stupid to get out of this. And, it was made by graduate students, by the way, who were obviously parroting their education. And, I mean, uh, you know, making fun of their education. And here, you know, one good way to do this is you make portals and direct the lasers at each other and destroy them. And you feel very smart when you do that. Um, and, you know, you have to go by hazards and do a bunch of stuff. Now, the thing about games is because they put problems, you know, in my opinion, good games are at heart problem solving spaces. Right? They're goal-directed problem-solving spaces with a win state. That's what makes a thing a game. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot of evidence in, in cognitive science that uh, and we may or may not have time for this, is that humans learn best when you give them experiences where there's clear goals. Right? And games, of course, have lucid and clear goals, which is why they're very effective experience for learning. But a game like Portal or any other game that's, that's good is putting the emphasis on problem solving, not your ability to articulate the knowledge. And so if you play Portal, you get an embodied feel for the law of conservation momentum, but you certainly couldn't talk about it. Right? Nothing in the game teaches you to talk about it. But what you find in gaming, not just in games, is that today, games uh, are not just the software. They're not just the game. There's almost always a community built around the game who get impassioned for it and start building stuff and talking to each other and kibitzing with each other. And those people begin to articulate knowledge. So I mean, here's a wiki entry that somebody built for Portal. This is articulating knowledge with a vengeance. So, you know, what you, what you, and by the way, he's linked the thing. I, I don't, he's linked, you know, uh, there's a number of links on this thing to actual sites where you're doing physics, right? And as you know, there's a whole modding community built around Portal, and there's people who said, well, what more could we do with it physically? See, so what this, this is telling us uh, as we go into the future of games is that you have, you, you should make a distinction, I think, between what I'll call a little G game and a big G game. 
is a distinction that my colleague David Schaefer first made. Uh, he wasn't trying to name them after me either. Uh, the, uh, a little G game is the software. That's the, that's the thing that's in the box. But the big G game is the whole set of social interactions and community interactions built around the game. And what you find in a lot of gaming is that the game itself, the little g game, is very good to get embodied problem solving and the community then lays articulation on it. To the extent that you do that, notice that you can't get the disconnect you get in school between problem solving and articulation. You can't get it because you've got the problem solving base and then you go into this articulating community and you have uh, experiences and images, what I'll call situated meanings, to put the words onto. And therefore they're lucid. So it's a, it's a different a different way of uh, doing stuff. Um, now, so uh, uh, when you look at, uh, one of the reasons I like Portal for this example is, uh, you know, this is an entertainment game. Nobody was trying to teach physics with it. Um, this is a piece of advertising. This is one, you know, the, uh, you've got the Portal in the orange box probably. Uh, this was an ad they had on the internet for it. The game is designed to change the way players approach, manipulate, and surmise the possibilities in a given environment. And, you know, seeing this as an ad reminds me so much of, in all of this stuff, you know, you see these capitalist con you know, companies that are out for profit ha with much better educational theories than we've got. Uh, and this is a damn good educational theory. Notice what they're saying. They're saying, you know, what we did is you live in the everyday three-dimensional world, but you've never seen it the way you're going to see it now. When I give you this portal gun, and you have to look at the world of where can I place the portals and how can I use uh, the laws of the world and the laws of physics to get to those portals to solve problems, you will look at the world in a wholly different way. The tool given will, not, will let you, in this beautiful phrase, surmise the possibilities in a given environment, see new possibilities in the environment. Now, in a world in which we live today, where so many complex systems, the environment, civilization clashes, the economy, um, uh, you know, global warming, uh, uh, you know, it, these systems are interacting to really bring disaster upon us. Could there be a better 21st century view of education than giving people tools, new tools, to surmise new possibilities, especially since we now see that the so-called experts did not see the possibility. You know, Alan Greenspan shows up after this disaster to tell Congress, and 40 years as an expert in economics, I never saw this coming. Nothing I learned made any sense to me about this. That tells you what the value of individual expertise is today. So what you see is a possibility in 21st century engagement that Portal Sam suggests is building tools that allow people, and we're going to see later, collaboratively often, to surmise new possibilities in complex systems and in worlds so that they can hit on actual solutions to problems that really matter. All right, so surmise is an interesting word here because it means, you know, imagining something before you have full evidence for it and then being able to act on it and test it out. And that's what you get to do in Portal uh, in a purely fun way. Uh, to do that. So the paradigm, just a little example of Portal, is just meant to be one example of many, of, uh, of the paradigm that in games there are teachers, right? Some people have the idea, well, oh, they're just experience. But the teaching in game is the design, right? The designer has taught through designing the game to guide and mentor you in ways that do not take away your creativity and your sense of freedom, but are actually you know, you're, they're pretty tightly mentoring you in, a good, in good game design. So teaching is guided experience. The designer is t letting you get an experience but guiding you through it in a way with clear goals and stuff that we know is particularly good uh, for learning. Uh, learning is, is a matter not of content or facts. It's a matter of problem solving. Uh, assessment is not done after the learning. It's done inside the learning. And the articulation can go on inside the game, but a good deal of the articulation goes on in the communities built around the game, many of which, as you know, in these types of communities, which I've called affinity spaces or affinity groups, uh, you know, it, it, people in the group mentor each other, and sometimes you teach, sometimes you learn, sometimes you're the boss, sometimes you're not. They're, they've got an interesting uh, structure. Let me say something about this thing of assessment being inside the learning. Uh, you know. Uh, we think that it is, if I say to you, you know, somebody taught a six-week unit on algebra and then they did a test afterwards, you would find that completely natural, right? You'd say, well, that's obvious they did that and that's what we do. Now, on the other hand, what I, what I want to suggest to you is that thinking of assessment that way, you know, we teach and then we give an assessment, it's actually very, very, very weird, uh, even though we've now taken it for granted. And, and you can see it's weird if you're a gamer. So imagine uh, somebody played Halo on Har. How many people have played Halo? 
So uh, you know, imagine you played Halo on hard. Anybody played Halo on hard? Right? So it's pretty hard. Uh, but so you know, you go through Halo and you play Halo and you end Halo. If somebody had played Halo on hard, would it would you be possessed of then saying they should take a Halo test? I mean, you say that, that's a weird thing in the world. I mean, if you played Halo on hard and you finished, it's a guarantee you know Halo. See what's happening there? If we really trust that learning has been well designed, we're not tempted to assess it. The act of finishing it is already the best assessment. And in good game design, you can't finish a well-designed game without being good at it. And therefore, it'd be silly to be giving a test on it. So why do we find it natural to say, well, we had six weeks of algebra, but now we've got to give a standalone outside test? It's because we don't trust the learning. We don't trust it was well-designed. We don't trust teachers. Right? And uh, if, if we trusted them as much as we trust Bungie, we wouldn't be giving tests. All right, now um, I want to move to something else here. Uh, and try to move through this fairly quickly because for many people this may or may not be uh, relevant. But I, I want to get across that you know the type of learning, now this is for real kids, gamers, kids that are in real culture, uh, the type of learning they are doing around games when they are well mentored, that is when they are really being pushed and they're in a peer group and they're having help. Because by the way, one of the key things here to keep in mind is the evidence is getting fast pretty convincing that games don't make you a lot smarter unless if you, all you're doing is playing them. You actually have to be mentored and to think about it and relate it to other technologies, relate it to other stuff. You have to be a strategic gamer, uh, uh, which most many gamers are. And I want to look a little bit though. Here, here are eight things that I think kids, if they're, if they're well mentored and they're in a good peer group and they're being strategic about games, these are eight things kids pick up from games before they've ever, and they do not pick it up in school. And I would argue to you as we go through this, even though I'll do it relatively fast, is that this stuff, I want you to think as we go through this and say, Why, my God, that, in a way, that's a curriculum that's more impressive than what you get in school these days. Even, and in, at some points, we're going to see it directly competes with school. So let's imagine, I'll take one example, because this is one I studied a couple of years ago with seven-year-olds seven year playing age mythology. Now, one thing you learn when you play Age of Mythology, uh, if you're proactive, is that playing is already, even to play a game is to be a designer. Because you have to think, how do I want to play this game to get my goals recognized, to play it by my style, and to be successful? And an example, the seven-year-old I'm going to take as my example here, was playing Age of Mythology. Uh, he had started, um, and uh, uh, he didn't, this was a little kid that really liked to build, but he didn't like time pressure. And you know, in these real-time strategy games, the trouble is people will rush you, right? And then you're trying to build, and then they rush you, and you get defeated, and you didn't get to build, and then you have to really rush yourself. And so this kid didn't like time pressure. He really liked the building. Of course, he wanted to win, too. Uh, so he um, uh, found, like many kids do, a cheat, and he built a purple hippo. Right now, um, I, I had actually watched this kid, I, I you know, play, and I saw about six of these purple hippos go by, and I said to him, you know, it's been a long time since I'd done mythology, but where in the pantheon was a purple hippo with a purple hat on? Well, here's what the purple hippo does: the purple hippo uh, goes over to the other people and sprays purple paint on their buildings, the other civilizations, and they have to spend all their time cleaning the paint off and can't rush you. So now he's built the game to his own style. You know, later I. I told this story some years ago at a conference and somebody who you know, wanted to was, said, well, you know, that, you're celebrating a kid who's just using crutches, right? He's, a, he's not really learning to play the game. So, and I you know, believed this guy for a minute. And I called up um, the kid and I said, well, you know, what about this thing? What do you think when I saw him? I, what do you think about it? Is, is that a crutch? And he said, no, it's not a crutch. He says, I'm down to a one, per, one hippo game now anyway. Right, he was weeding himself off the hippos as he went <laughs> along. And so you know, he, was, he was actually designing to play, designing for his style, and then teaching himself and eventually weaned off the hippos. Another good example, of course, I'm going to try to juxtapose this very different. This, you, know, you really can't play The Sims without designing, because that's all it is, is you design and build stuff. So playing is already design. Um, but kids quickly discover that playing is not just design, is that in the modern games you can mod them, right? You, you can be a designer. So in Age of Mythology, you can f quickly catch on, and the seven-year-olds, all, all the ones we looked at did, that it has a scenario and map editor. 
And you can build whole scenarios. You can put artificial intelligence in them. You can build a whole game level uh, from scratch. And the kids that we saw, they, you know, they just opened it up first and started to put objects around and said, oh, I'll make a cool looking thing. And then what happens is as they say, they realize you can do more and more with it, they join modding communities and they learn a little bit of more and more and more until they're really little tech experts uh, through this uh, modding. So now they're really, be, they're really becoming designers uh, and they can take it as far as they want, especially if they find one of these communities that will push them. So you can get in an Asian mythology community and have people with PhDs in artificial intelligence mentoring you if you want. And you could be seven, or you can be 12. On the other hand, you could have a 13-year-old, and we've seen examples of who's mentoring the PhDs. So you can go either way. This is an example of modding that we don't really think of much from The Sims. This is a woman who created a challenge for other Sims players to reenact Barbara Einrich's nickel and dime book in The Sims. Uh, you had to live a life as a single mother. And she had a rule book of like 50 rules. Because this is not easy to do in The Sims. And you have to ignore a lot of The Sims. Because like when the genie brings you the lamp, you can't get a wish. Because poor people don't get wishes. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, and then, you know, with this challenge, you had to go through a whole life. You had to get your kids out of the house safely. Nobody could take them away. If you got a bonus if they went to college. And then you had to write a graphic novel describing what you did. What is she doing? Here, she's not modding in the traditional sense of changing software. She's modding rules of play. She's modding in the kind of Katie Salen, Eric Zimmerman rules of play way. She is changing people's rules of play. Uh, now, the other thing that games teach you to do, of course, and this has been uh, written about a good bit and is getting to be very popular, is it's very hard to play a game without thinking of systems. That is, to being a system thinker. So in Age of Mythology, for example, this is just some of the areas in which you can do research. And think about, what, think about this, what kids are doing in a game like this, or in Rise of Nations, or in Age of Empires. or They are actually tr trying to track hundreds of variables at once and making decisions that no human on Earth has ever made until these games come along. Let me give you an example. In some of these games, including a non-real-time one like Civilization, you can make a decision like this and say, should I invest in technology now, or should I wait 800 years? <laughs> See, no, no leader has ever had to do that. We, however, live in a world in which that type of thinking is actually getting. See, had we thought even 50 years ago or 75 years ago, maybe I shouldn't do all this coal stuff, we'd be sitting pretty now, right? But we've never lived in a world where people thought, well, I've got to think really far into the future because these systems can act very strongly over time. Kids do this all the time, and you have to track. So a kid has to say of any of these levels at any moment, which of these should, should I put my points into research and strategy or religion or ages, or how should I balance it? So you have system thinking with a, a kind of vengeance. Uh, here. Now, I mean, another example in the Sims of system thinking is imagine the thinking that goes into this challenge. You actually have to think of all the variables in a poor person's life and how to manipulate them in some way that allows you to survive over the long haul. Um, uh, and uh, now, the other thing kids pick up from age mythology or games like this is technical language literacy. So, uh, here, I mean, just examples, I'm not going to read these, but you know, as kids decide I want to build a scenario or I want to mod a bit. Then they end up in these sites, these affinity spaces, and they see stuff like this. Right? Now, now, if this is a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old, this is going to be well beyond anything they do in school. Right? And uh, uh, here's another one for uh, The Sims. See, this is the sort of thing. See, so we saw kids regularly start getting interested. And what, unlike school, nobody age grades it. So all of a sudden, they bump into this stuff. Um, and, and if they're really highly motivated, they start doing it, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, um, they, of course, they pick up digital literacy skills. In addition to technical language skills, they pick up digital literacy skills. I've already said that. Learning how to mod is a gateway for many people into computer science, into engineering, into other, uh, other things. Uh, here is a community of people making machinima for The Sims. By the time you're really into machinima or you're into modding, you are now really into digital literacies that have good uh, travel, good transfer uh, for uh, tech skills. Now, uh, though people have bemoaned that this new digital stuff is taking away from traditional literacy, you know, reading and writing, it's uh, far from it. Kids read and write more than they ever had. Uh, but it, has ch it is changing the ecology of literacy very deeply. Uh, it, 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 kids are confronting much more complex language earlier than ever. And much of it is technical language, like that technical language we just saw. But here's an example. I mean, back to the seven-year-olds. 
we're playing age mythology, you know, there's, it, when they go on uh, the age mythology site, one of the little things you can do there that a lot of them loved was you can take a little test, you know, fill out answers to a question, and it tells you what god you would have been which was very motivating. They all wanted to know what god they would have been. And uh, you know, this is the sort of thing you get when, uh, when you, when you get, find out what god you are. I mean, that is written at a very high level, right? Read that. That's, that's not baby talk. It's not, it's not decodable text. In fact, we had one seven-year-old who was reading one of these, and he read the whole thing until he got to the last sentence. He says, oh, I can't read this. It's over my head. <laughs> but he's so motivated, he couldn't remember he couldn't read it until he had read it. Um, so, uh, it, you know, you're picking up that. And, of course, uh, the, another example, when you're writing these graphic novels and The Sims, you're, of course, doing a lot of traditional literacy stuff. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, the kids are picking up from this stuff, which is absolutely crucial, a skill not much on offer in school, is what distributed knowledge or collaboration. That is being able to uh, coordinate yourself with other people or with smart tools so that as a group, you can bring off stuff smarter than the, than the smartest person in the group, which is, you know, when you look at workplace people or look at businesses, this is, this is really uh, a core skill that they want. So here's an example from Age of Mythology where if you join one of these affinity groups, you can get in and collaborate with people to do AI. They'll mentor you, they'll teach you as long as you're willing to put up with the curve, and you can work with teams of people if you want. And of course, you get very smart tools because you get a bunch of good digital tools to do the scripting with and to do some of the modding. The same with the machinima. This site doesn't just let you join a group. It gives you some very smart tools and some he very helpful stuff as long as you can coordinate with it. So uh, it really is a modern view of knowledge where you resource people with other people and with tools so they engage in distributed cognition, not just thinking inside uh, their head. Uh, the final thing I want to say, because I've mentioned these these uh, affinity spaces, is as kids get into this stuff, they can join these, uh, what I've called, the, I was referring to as affinity spaces, but another good term, other terms used from their passion communities or pro-am communities. And, and that is, you know, today, any kid, uh, if they really want to put up with the learning curve, can join a non-age graded group of people and become a virtual professional with no certificate in machinima or science blogging or uh, building engineering tools or digital movies, whatever they want to do. And uh, I mean, an example, there's billions of examples of this. Uh, a good example would be a little girl we've worked with in The Sims who uh, designed clothes in The Sims and then discovered she could upload them and then she had 400 people around the world take her clothes and praise her and then she decided, well, okay, she went into Second Life and she built in the building tools of Second Life her own store and sells her stuff now for Linden dollars, which is transferable, of course, to real money and now she makes money at 13, as well as, by the way, uh, this is a rural Wisconsin girl who is really no good at school uh, and now with her shop and Second Life and her uh, international reputation as a designer, she gives talks at conferences. <laughs> I run into her every once in a while at a conference uh, giving a talk on uh, designing and uh, building with uh, digital tools. Right? Uh, so she's a pro-am. See, she's a 13-year-old she's a expert. By the way, she still sucks at school. But it's not clear to me she's not going to be successful because she's picked up. And, and you know, when, when somebody asked her once, well, you know, with all that stuff, what did you learn you want to do with your future? Expecting her to say, I want to be a clothes designer. She said, no, I learned I want to work with computers because they give you power. What she really wants is power. Now, by the way, just as people have said with boys, very often computer games are a gateway drug to technical careers. The Sims is a gateway drug to technical careers for women we've paid no attention to because gamers look down on it, right? How many people here have played The Sims? Right. Uh, uh, good, Some, a, a couple men, but you know, much less than played Halo. Uh, and you know gamers snicker at The Sims and say it's not hardcore gaming, uh, though they revere its designer as what the greatest game designer will write. It's a real paradox. Uh, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that The Sims is generating a huge community of creativity that goes pretty much untapped because a lot of, not all of the players, but a lot of them are women. Uh, and they're modding in different ways. All right, so um, in the remaining time I have here, let me see what I'm going to do. Yeah, I want to uh, I want to say uh, finish then w what the implications that are for if, if we're going to move games to school. So I'm an advocate of what I call situated meaning. This is a controversial matter, though it won't be for long. 
Um, and that is that there's really two ways. You know, I've already said in, in the center of school is articulation in language, right? But there are two ways of understanding language. Uh, one is what is verbal. That is, if you don't understand a piece of language, what do I do? I give you more language. I give you a dictionary. I give you a textbook. I give you another text. If you don't understand one text, I give you another one, right? Uh, so a verbal way is to understand words through words. A situated way of understanding words is to be able to attach an image, an action, experience, or dialogue with the word, right? Not just another word. Now, I believe the evidence is overwhelming that situated meanings work for problem solving. That if you understand language in a situated way, that is, you can assign images, actions, experience, and, uh, and dialogue to it, you can use it for problem solving. Right? Now, on the other hand, of course, you can't assign images, actions, and dialogues to it if you've had none. Right? If all you've had is a textbook, you can hardly assign images, actions, and dialogues. Now, an example of this is uh, that, uh, that hit me, where this hit me very strongly, is when I first started to play games about six and a half years ago, um, I did the baby boomer thing of trying to read the manual. Right? I sat down, took, ripped open the manual, went and read it quietly, and said, I'm going to get good at this game. And the trouble was I couldn't make heads or tails of the manual. See, and I remember from my second game, Deus Ex, getting to this point in the manual and just saying, this is the most boring, inane thing I have ever read. I cannot possibly play this game because I can't make sense of what this says. I, I, mean, I understand every word. I just don't know what it's for or what you're going to do with it. And then I did what every kid would have done. I played the game. And then went back after a few hours of playing the game, not, not very well, and read this little manual, read this piece, and I couldn't recover any longer why it wasn't clear. It's just crystal clear. Why? Because now I had an image and action and dialogue from the game to attach to every word of it. Now notice that by the way you've done that, this is by the way the principle of performance before competence. Perform, get some experience, get some images, get some actions and dialogue, then go read the text because now you've got something to anchor them into. Uh, but you're going to use the text in a very different way. Now you're going to use it as a reference. You're not going to, use, you're not going to read it like a novel. Uh, now, this, I want to say that exactly the same thing is true of school. See, so here is something from a high school uh, science textbook. That is just as inane, just as boring as the game manual. In fact, though, it has another, I mean, I won't bore you with this because it's not really, well, it's actually relevant, but it's boring anyway. Uh, and, and that is that, there's a lot of evidence that, it, that this type of language, so-called specialist language or academic language, is the biggest barrier to school success for kids. This is what they can handle by high school. So this is why people who drop out, drop out. Not phonics, by the way. They can read, they just don't want to read this. And they don't want to read this because they have exactly the same feeling towards it as I had towards that manual. They had never seen the game. You see, geology is a game. You play it by certain professionals, do it. They have certain roles. And by the way, every geologist has a, a tremendous number of images, actions, experience, dialogues, and even arguments and fights with their colleagues attached to those words. So what it what really tells you is what we're doing in school is we're giving people manuals with no game and then testing them on their verbal retention of the manual. Uh, and that in fact, my argument is if we gave people the game, that is let them play geology as a goal-directed game with clear rules, this language would be just as easy as that game manual. And then you'd have the, uh, the weird thing that no kid could really fail. Right? Once they had situated meetings, that language is no longer hard. And they can't fail to understand what it is, just as I can't fail to understand the manual after I played the game. So if you do want a hierarchical system with a lot of people failing, then you give, you give manuals with no games. Now, that, so the moral of the story is school, has, is, as we know it, is locked into a content fetish. That is, it's about facts. It's, you know, biology is the 1,200 facts somebody in biology discovered. And when you memorized 1,100 of them and got them on a piece of paper, you pass biology. However, biology, physics, chemistry are not facts. They are problems to be solved. And biologists, chemists, physicists use facts as tools to solve problems. To a, to a linguist or to a biologist, facts about their domain are tools that they use to solve problems. And once they have used that tool over and over again, they can't forget it. This is why my colleague David Schaefer and has kids play an urban planning game where they have to be, they have to plan, they have to plan, replan Madison where he lives in Wisconsin, uh, just as a professional would do. 
And to do that, they've got to use a piece of software that's like in a SimCity type game. And there's like 300 codes that are arbitrary to, to make planning decisions. And you ha the digital software requires you to use those codes, which are the city codes. Now, school would have had somebody memorize the 300 codes, and then you get to play the game. And you can understand why 8 out of 10 kids would say, I don't even want this game. What, but what he does is he says, you've got to behave like a professional. In the end, you've got to give a report. You have to, in, the, in the real world, to real professionals. So you're going to fall on your face here if you don't, can't to defend your planning decisions. Um, and by the way, you have to use these codes. By the time the kids have planned and taken criticism and the people are you know, in the game, the greens complain because you have too much parking and they've replanned, they all know the code's free. They don't even know how they got them, right? They have to use them as tools to solve problems. So the irony is in game-based learning, if the center of attention is in problem solving, the stuff that school's all about comes free. You get it free. Uh, and then you get problem solving to boot. But if you start with it, Nobody sees as a tool for anything. So uh, facts, uh, game-based learning should be not about content fetishes. Or games should not be about content. They should be about problems to be solved and giving people smart tools to solve them. Facts are some of those tools. There's a lot of other uh, tools. All right. One, this, is, this will be the end. One, let me just say one thing about assessment. Uh, that uh, I think that if any area of education gets revolutionized by games, it'll be assessment. Uh, I want you to think, how many people have played real-time strategy game like Rise of Nations? Okay, we're getting lower and lower here. Okay, a little. Uh, Rise of Nations is a fabulous game, by the way. It has the best tutorial system of any game made. So if you're making, if you're going to make any games for learning, do look at the tutorial system of Rise of Nations. It, it first of all realizes that people have different styles, and so it gives you the alternative to do the tutorial in different styles of learning. And if you're doing one and you quit, it'll come on and say, you know, maybe you quit this because you don't like this way of learning, but there's another way. Could you like, we want to try that, right? And it's, it's actually beautifully done, unlike the tutorial for CIP4. And, uh, but at any rate, you know, when, when you play a, ri a, a real-time strategy game, you're playing against these other civilizations. And then at the end of it, after you've played maybe a few hours, you, you get a bunch of graphs that graph out everything you did. Now, I'm going to show you the graphs. I, I'm only, I was doing this on my own, so I only played one other civilization because I wanted to be sure I won so that I didn't show graphs of me losing. So here's the map, uh, uh, graph showing the achievements in the game, the score for total army combat territory, city economy research, wonders, units built. This is all the military achievements. These are the economy achievements. Um, these are the research achievements, you know, all of them with a dozen variables. These are the, all the player speeds at every level, every age. Here's the score graph across everything in a different graphic form. The military graph, the territory graph, the resource graph, the technology graph, the timeline of who entered each age at what time. Now, think about that uh, for a minute. That, um, uh, let's get rid of this. Uh, you know, this doesn't look like fun. I mean, you're pouring through, um, uh, you're pouring through the, all these graphs, right? And it's part of the game, right? You, I mean, when I play that game, I think it's one of the fun parts of the game. What's going on there with all these graphs? What is it doing? It, it actually is a, is a profoundly good theory of learning. It says people learn through experience. But the trouble with experience is it's too concrete. But you have to have the experience. So you play the game, and you get a bunch of experience. And then it says, we're going to give you these graphs so that you can think strategically about all. Oh, you say, that guy, he d invested in technology 500 years earlier than me. I was doing these wonders, but I was, you know, but, uh, but look, he had these military units by this time. But my tax, you know, you're, you're getting all these variables. And why are you doing it? Because you want to build better strategies for your next time you play, right? You want to understand what happened to me, what can be done better. The thing is now pushing you to theorize your experience, to build a theory of it, and then to take it right back in to form better strategies and test it. So it's, it's do, what the game is saying is learning is about experience, and then after it, theorizing the experience to get a new language to understand the experience, and then imposing that on new experience. And then what you get is the best of both worlds, concrete experience that gets to be generalized enough to have a whole theory behind it. And this is built entirely as a game. Now, I think that's truly 21st century assessment. I think we're going to demand that anything you build, whether it's a game or not, for 21st century learning, that you give people those rich, deep experiences so they have the game and not just the manual, but you also give them the opportunity to theorize that experience strategically so they come out of it both problem solving and articulating. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Okay, I think I did it with just the time I was told. Yes, Catherine. No. Look, I mean, uh, I can, you know, I mean, I, there are some experience that I had in my life that one I'm thinking of right now that lasted 13 seconds was one of the deepest ones I ever had early in life. It depends on uh, how that experience gets interpreted. See, experience is good for learning only if it's getting interpreted, it's goal-based, and, you're, and, you're then, and you have some time to reflect on it later. So uh, there's good work in physics that shows that having a person throw a basketball up in the air while simultaneously seeing a representation of it uh, in multiple ways is a very good experience to map representation onto experience. So, it, no, it doesn't have to be. Now, there's a lot of stuff we could do with deep immersive worlds, right? Uh, but it, it, it's the quality of the experience. And remember, this is guided experience. It's designed experience. It's the quality, not the quantity. Yep. What would you say about games like um, the Fable series? Yeah. Would that usually require the same kind of learning in that field, too? Well, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, sure. I mean, you know, Peter Molyneux has an interesting idea, and that is that he, he wants to make games more and more user friendly. He, he has a, a vision in which you can just turn a game on, and there should be never a blockage in you going forward with that game. That's his ideal. He wants, he, I once heard him say he wants no interface for the game at all. He wants you just completely transparently uh, in that world. Uh, as a result, Fable 1, and especially Fable 2, is, is an interesting thing, uh, in, and there's a number of games on this line. It's actually much easier. You can't, I don't, it's very difficult to lose Fable 2, right? I don't know if you played it, but it's very difficult to lose it. Uh, just like the new Prince of Persia. You literally can't lose the new Prince of Persia. Um, that takes, see, and the, one of the reasons people are doing that is they want to widen the audience for games. And it is true that some games were way too maddlingly difficult. But the trouble is that difficulty and challenge is part of the designed experience and it's part of the feedback. Failure, game, game, another way, game learning is failure-based learning, right? You, you, you learn from failure. So uh, actually something is taken away from those games by the, um, the act of uh, not being able to fail. Now something is in the game and th those are very good games in which you have to, you, it's an open sort of play like Oblivion where you've got to make a whole decision about how you want to play and what you want to do. Like Grand Theft Auto or these very open ended games, they do require you to theorize your own play. What do you want to achieve? At? Otherwise I believe in games like that you're pretty bored. Unless you, with Oblivion a lot of people got very bored. They, they all said they wanted a very open ended game then they got one and said geez give me some direction here guy. Uh, on the other hand, you know, in, in, I loved Oblivion because what it allowed me to do is to put my structure on the game and then I became a designer. So I think that the, the, those games, if you're putting your structure on it, um, then it is inviting you to be a, a designer as a player. But they do, this is a big issue now in gaming stuff about what is the role of challenge going to be. We're seeing a whole bunch of games now in which the challenge level is really lowered very precipitously. How many people played the new Prince of Persia? It's a gorgeous game, and it's a fun game, but it's, a, it, but, you know, it's weirdly frustrating in that you can't lose. In a, in a, in a sense, you know, you say, I deserve to have lost there. You see, but what happens is pretty soon it does say you have to set your own standard. When you're fighting the bosses and, you know, you really can't lose uh, that easily, cause, uh, but you can say, I'm not doing this very well. I've got to get better, and you can impose your own structure on it. Uh, so I don't know, uh, and I think those are very interesting experiments, yeah? And what about story-wise? You know, this is a huge controversy. You know, people have very different views. Uh, you know, I, here's my view on, on stories, but this is massively controversial. You know, a lot of people think stories are central to games, and you know, Carmack said they play the same role in games as they do in pornography, which is minimal. Um, uh, uh, the architectural story, you know, the big story, the Henry James type story, the big type of story you get in Final Fantasy, uh, is, to me, only motivating in creating a world. Right? I, when I'm going through Final Fantasy or Deus Ex, I actually don't remember the whole big story. But what I do know is I'm in the midst of all these details and themes. So it creates a milieu or a world that can be very motivating. And it also can make lucid why you're doing what you're doing. See, Braid was interesting in this regard. People, you know, because of the weird story in Braid, everybody wanted to know, is it explaining why I'm doing this? Or is it irrelevant? I mean, see, that actually created a very interesting thing as gamers all said, well, geez, what theory of why I'm doing this gameplay given that story? So it, 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 the one role of story is to motivate what you're doing and to create this world. I don't, the architectural, you know, figuring out like in a literary crit class, Henry James, those stories, they don't work for that, right? Because 
they have to allow for your decisions. But much more important sense of story, one that is completely novel for games, is games are essentially about your story. When you play it, you narrativize your play. You have a, you know, if you played full spectrum war, you had a military career. It's like you could sit by the fire and say, I remember this time, or I just chose to do this. Boy, that was a dumb decision. And if games take that away, if you don't come out of that game with a feeling that I have narrativized my own play in a way, in my own career, then the story is hurting you, not helping you. Right? And that, it's, so it, you know, and that story is made around giving people good decisions, interesting decisions to make. Yeah. If, if the narrative takes away from problem solving and decisions you make in your sense that you, it's, it's your story in the world that I believe they take away from it. Other people don't. I'm giving you my view. So take World of Warcraft. Who gives a damn about the overall story in World of Warcraft? I mean, if you want to map out all the elves' problems and their neuroses, you can do that. But everybody who's played it for a thousand hours, which is the minimal time, practically, with that game, uh, has a plethora of, you know, you, when you're flying on your mount over an area, you remember all the events that happened in that area. So, oh, I remember when I did, and, and with who you did them. You, have a, you just, you narrativize the entire lands, not with a Henry James big architectural story, with kind of an emotional story about, I remember this event, and I remember, uh, you know, that, because you've been in lit crit classes, you, it's easy to think of that as trivial, but that's the emotional heart of the story in World of Warcraft, it's, is that a landscape is overlaid with your own narrative of play, uh, and, and a social narrative, and that's really an amazing experience, though you can't take it to a lit crit class and, and analyze it. Yep. Well, how about something like Bioshock? Uh, Bioshock is, to me, a, a great architectural story whose major outlines I never remembered. And, and what it did for me is it made that world very weird. And those little girls, which I regret to this day killing, because the little girl got mad at me later, uh, it created a milieu. You know, look, here's, it, there is a form of storytelling in, native, in some Native American cultures called thematic abstraction. They think that if you tell somebody a great, big, architectural, wonderful story, you actually took away their own ability to participate. You know, you authored it all, you built it all, and they just listened to it. What they do for storytelling is they try to give you some, just some themes and metaphors that abstract from a whole narrative, and then you in your head, and through talk, build the story with them. That's what games should be about. That's what World of Work, you're, you're throw, and if, if the, uh, you know, the Bioshock is doing that, it's throwing out some very interesting themes and metaphors that allow you to take them in and make sense of what you're doing. I don't remember the whole story. I mean, then maybe this is just my flaw. I, I don't remember the whole story of any game I've ever played. But I remember the feel intimately. I remember in Deus Ex finding all the little snippets that put the story together. But you know, you're being shot at while you're doing that. So how are you going to remember the whole story? And also, I think Bioshock does a good job at that. I mean, so you, so you get it. I don't think the architectural part of the story is the big thing. I think you want a story that's thematic abstraction in the Native American way, and you want decision making that lets people narrativize their own career. But people like Sasha Barab would disagree with me viciously on this. But he's wrong. Yes? Um, you kind of mentioned it with like, um, World of Warcraft and the, uh, talking about the community um, where you talk about the game. Yeah. So, so, you know, John Seeley Brown wrote an article about World War. He's a big information guru, Xerox Park, he was the head of Xerox Park, and so he's a big guy. Uh, and he wrote an article called, You Play World of Warcraft, You're Hired. Uh, he felt that the guild management was such good skills. But I'm talking, this is before Burning Crusade, where you could really do big, you know, that they got rid of it in part because they didn't like the sort of, uh, kick-ass attitude that people had about it. Uh, but he felt, and lots of people have argued that, you know, the social skills, the collaborative skills, and the leadership skills you pick up in World of Warcraft or lineage with castle sieges uh, is, in fact, very good for the uh, marketplace, and you are picking up a lot of them. With this proviso, though, is the army in making games, and, you know, they make a lot of them, they have pretty much mandated with games that are in the army that they have to have what they call ac after-action reviews. You not you have to play the game, but you have to then get out of it and compare strategy with the other players and reflect on it. They have found that a lot of the learning does not play, take place 
uh, if you do not, ref much like that rise of nations thing. And see, people do that in World of Warcraft with a vengeance, right? With an absolute, they get out of there and they start reflecting and they even write up whole research reports. So. Uh, yes, uh, multiplayer games are great for skills, but you still want to get the st strategy session, the after action review, which is built in these big G games, the social environment around the game. Yes? I don't want to put you on the spot, but you alluded to a 13 second experience you had. Uh, yes, but it would be dirty for me to tell you. No worries. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, think about your early day, you know, think about your first sexual encounter. I mean, you know. You know, it was a wonderful moment, but it went quickly. Uh, you know, so the point is that, you know, look, what about, we know, like take flashbulb memories, you know, it's something that's actually studied. Uh, you know, the, for many people, in my generation, Kennedy's assassination is a flashbulb moment, right? I remember exactly where I was. Uh, I was in a boarding school that I, we weren't allowed out of, and somebody came into a study hall and said they've shot the president. And the president of our school was a guy named, he was a priest named Father Giaquino. And I turned around and said, why would anybody want to shoot Father Giaquino? Uh, because my world was so small. Uh, but then I found out it was Kennedy. And that little episode is in my head. And I, I was 14. That it's in my head like that, right? So that's an experience that, uh, uh, and so that wasn't very long, but it's very vivid. You know, obviously, if we knew how to make flashbulb memories out of games, I mean, you would have this wonderful power. Uh, and there are some games that have gotten close. And, you know, there's a big thing in the gaming at GDC every year. You know, games will only be art if they make you cry. Uh, to me, if you haven't cried in a few games, you haven't played enough of them. You know, but people cry in different games. This, this yeah? Famous story, I think Dan Pink relates it, mm -hmm. where it's an acting school, and it might be uh, NYU or something. Yeah. But the was in and said, the president's just been shot, and they do method. The actors think this is a method exercise. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they thought it was an, an, an exercise, yeah. So uh, on the other hand, you know, I, don't, I do want to say that, the, you know, one thing we know, when you build an immersive world that people stay in a long time, like Oblivion or World of Warcraft or Bioshock or Mass Effect, you know, you're in there for 20 to 100 hours, there's a big payoff on that. Human learning is a practice effect. So if you're an educator and you could say, wow, I can get somebody in here for 50 to 1,000 hours, that, that is a massive payoff. By the way, business, you know, since we're in an economy where attention is the biggest thing, you can't get much share of people's attention in our world. When you tell advertisers or industry, well, a game gets 100 hours of it, they're just, they're just over the top. Uh, so I, I know it's popular these days because games are expensive to uh, think, let's build short experiences, and I'm not against it. But, you know, anybody who builds a world as immersive as World of Warcraft that is on other things is, is really going to own a huge part of the human soul. Catherine? Do you think that ties to the kinesthetic part of the human being? In other words, mm -hmm. someone who drives like a maniac in Grand Theft Auto for hundreds or thousands of hours? No, no, no. No, because, because we have higher cortex and, you know, you, 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 I mean, I think people do who don't have their higher cortex, yeah. Few of those people exist. But I thought what you were going to add, the kinesthetic part of games is very crucial. Uh, there is good evidence that when, he, that, you know, in evolutionary terms, we feel power over the part of uh, space in which we can directly control with our bodies, where we have micro control, where I can, and so for most of human history, that's about this wide. Blind people have a feeling of acute microcontrol out to the end of their cane. And you know you get this effect that they actually feel the cane as the end of their brain. I mean, they really, games allow you to do this very weird thing of having microcontrol over something in a virtual world. And it's why we feel that the body went into the virtual world. This is a very real embodied effect that you feel your body went into that world because of this evolutionary trick. Now, any, if you don't believe that, watch a seven-year-old play Mario. When he jumps, what does he do? He jumps out of his seat, right? Uh, and so this, that, that microcontrol is a powerful neural device. It, there's that and the fact that the human uh, brain, unless it uses conscious control, doesn't distinguish between media and real experiences. Those two things make games very, very powerful. When you get rid of them, that's why, by the way, Sam and Max is a great game, but you have no micro control over everything, you know, in adventure games. And therefore, you don't feel the immersion in an adventure game the way you do in uh, uh, Ninja Gaiden or Thief, where you're controlling. When, when you're playing Thief and he's melting into the ground and it's your body, because it is a surrogate body, you have got a neural mechanism. You know, and this is why, of course, some people think they're addictive. But 
Yes. Um, do you have any information how, on how game-based learning could support um, students or learners that, that are their whose digital skills or like technical skills are not up to par, or or also like oh, their see, language skills? Right, right. So that's see. So the thing is, there. If if you're making a game. And you're, you, and it's only for people who have played already thousands of hours of games. Not surprisingly, then people who don't play games will not. And there are games made that way. There are commercial games in which if you haven't played thousands of hours, Ninja Gaiden might be a good example. Don't start that as your first game. Uh, on the other hand, there's evidence from the 80s with Pat Greenfield's work that, for example, the so-called spatial deficit between women and men, so that w women are less, they always they say, oh, I can't do the space stuff that it takes about 90 minutes to undo that. She showed that with practice, 90 minutes later, the girls are just as good as the boys. It's, it's, these are, so what you want to do is you want to design a game that introduces people how to play games. And the best commercial games do that. They, have, they, they build tutorials and early levels that allow people to learn how to play games plus play it. And that's got to be what you do. So I, I have an article in Situated learning and language book on Rise of Nations and its tutorial. Rise of Nations is a great example that does not assume you are any good at real-time strategy games when you start. It, it absolutely allows you to say, I'm a real expert. I don't want any of your help, and go right into it. And they, they just say goodbye to you. That's great. Go enjoy yourself. And if, you, if you're no good at real-time strategy, because these are the most complicated games made, there's, it, it, they, will, they will really help you to learn to play that game. And they do it brilliantly. Uh, because, as I say in the article, they know that many people have had bad experiences with those games, and they have to remedy that. And they have a beautiful way of remedying. So, I mean, I never liked real-time strategy games until I played that game, because it was the first time I discovered I could play one. Right. So that's a dis that you know, there are people in the industry that are very bad at this. Right. They're they're making their games in ways that exclude people to begin. But uh, there are ways, I talk in other things in the last book, in the 2007 book, a whole series of things about how good games handle that hump. And by the way, it does appear people can be quite good at games after a few hours of practice. You know, you're not going to be Halo on hard, but you'll be just fine. Now, on the other hand, you may not like games. Nobody should be doing the same stuff, right? If you don't like games at all, then you should do something else. Yeah? Um, most of your examples were commercial off the shop games. Yes. And we all know the reason for why that is. Yes. Um, what do you think are the most pressing research questions that the research community should ask about how to actually build uh, educational games that are equally effective? Well, first of all, we're seeing, you know, the, the, the so-called serious, I don't like the word serious games, but you know people use that. The se serious game industry really developed much more slowly than people predicted, and it's still not well developed, and there's very few good games. And so one research question is, why is that? It could mean this is too hard. Um, I actually think it's due to baby boomers. Um, uh, you're just beginning to see much better stuff. I mean, a lot of the, I mean, I'm, this is a sad commentary because it's a commentary on people like me as well. A lot of the early games were made by either traditional instructional technology people, the people who think the way you learn is you cut everything into little bits and you order it in little serial things and you do the first little bit first and then you assess every little package. Uh, that does not, in general, make good games. Um, and it isn't, and it's not, and, and again, for problem solving, it's not actually the optimal way to learn because the pro often the parts are crucially relevant to the whole practice. Uh, but the other thing is the baby boomers made the games. I'm now, you know, and, and that's the reason they did is all the 20 somethings who were good at game design wanted to work for EA. Right? We tried to hire them. I, why should they work for you? You're only going to pay me. A now they don't want to work for EA and they're opening their own companies. And boy, you know, so one little company that we helped start. The biggest help we gave is staying out of it. Uh, Filament in Madison has now made a, a wonderful underwater science game that by far, in, to my mind, is the best ser so-called serious game made. It really looks like a game, it really plays like a game. And, and, you know, we're, and the, they're making our courts a game we're making with Sandra Day O'Connor. It was her idea. She wanted to reach kids on the importance of free courts. And what I learned is my biggest contribution is to tell them nothing to stay out of it uh, because uh, th th they, so I think, and you know, uh, so, and the other thing that you know is changing this is games that were not even serious games, just games that were really truly innovative independent games had no route to market. 
But now with all of the arcades, where you can download games from the Wii, the PlayStation 3, and the Xbox from their arcade things, people are now putting out games that would never have found the light of day. And those, they're not learning games, but they're certainly not regular commercial games. And they just, in, they're in such high quality, they embarrass learning games. So tell me why the guy who made Braid, he made it for 108,000 of his own money. He's a complete egomaniacal asshole. But, you know, because his attitude is if you, if you play that game and you ever use a cheat sheet, you should be out shot while humiliated, right? But it's a brilliant game. And he made it for $108,000. And he generated a discussion around it where people are actually having to go get therapy for playing the game. So, and Flower would be another example if you, if you played. I mean, you know, these are, these are we're, so we're going to get to that level. Somebody's going to begin to design stuff like that. Uh, which has a learning goal, and uh, then we're going to find out it didn't cost. Game Star Mechanic, a game that Game Lab made on money that we got at Wisconsin, you know, it cost about a million and about a million and a half to make, uh, which is pretty pricey. And um, and I again, I think we're going to get into communities, especially with modders. Uh, we're going to get into communities where we do a lot better, but we haven't been doing well. I don't think there's a lot of you know. Take the we're about to go to games for social change. Uh, you, you know, f taking, let's say, the category of games for civic participation, the number that have finished are any good probably could be done on one hand if you had no fingers. So, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's a very, that's a challenging, a challenging thing. Yep. What games are you playing right now? Um, I am playing Far Cry 2 which is an interesting thing because it's one of these totally open-ended games in which it isn't e you can get killed easily on a save system where you can get an hour of play lost. Uh, but you absolutely can do anything you want and go any place uh, you want to do. And then I just finished Resident Evil 5, which was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful game. Yeah. Right. It's a function of mentoring. The mentoring might be done by their peers, their parents, their organizations. Here's a study. I mean, this is a very important study. It's done by Susan Newman, who was the Deputy Secretary of Education and then quit. Um, and she, in order to sort of, you know, get poor and rich kids on an equal playing field, decided to put cutting-edge digital learning into libraries in Philadelphia. So you had really good stuff. And she found that the poor and rich families and her kids used, the, used them equivalently, so there wasn't a use difference. But she found that the middle class kids learned much more. Their literacy levels went up and their knowledge levels went up much more than the poor kids. And the reason was is the middle class kids went with their parents. And the parents said, uh, I want you to pick something that's a little above your reading level. I want you to persist past challenge. I don't want you to switch from one thing to another. And they talked to them about it. The poor families weren't there, so the kids did not pick things at the reading level. They didn't persist past challenge. They switched from one thing to another. The mentor, so you saw that digital tools are just like books. The thing we've learned about books and education is books make the rich richer and the poor poor. Right? If you're a good reader, you get richer and richer and richer. And if you're a poor reader, books make you poor and poor and poor. Digital media do the same thing. So mentor, now, mentoring is very new in this setting because that was mentoring where the parents are doing it. And a lot of upper class families do that at home. But there are, you, know, you join some of the age of mythology sites, you will be mentored richly by PhDs and adults and kids. And as long as you can get into that setting. The little girl who became the designer of Second Life was mentored in a tech-savvy girls club. She was mentored in a, by 60-year-old women in a SEM site, and then she was mentored by the Second Life community. That's a lot of mentoring. Mm -hmm. See, and if you ignore that, if you say, oh, I'm going to build a game that just works, no mentoring needed, you know, that's like you know, getting flour and adding nothing to it and wondering why it doesn't make a cake, right? OK, oh, there. I just had a quick question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Game jams, so to speak, yes. and which kind of levels the playing field as far as who can be game Sure, trainers. right. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that and also like uh, the learning process of going through that or and also the product that well, I think that, that's one. You talk about a research project. I mean, so what you see now is that I've always argued, you know, gaming invites you to be a designer. I mean, the very act of playing well is already co-designing with the designer. And then, you know, with all the modding and stuff, it invites you. What you see from the Sims stuff is that, you know, and with the social media, 
you see people designing social relationships and designing rules of play or rules of interaction among people with or without software. And we're, we're not, we're, we call modding that, that hardcore skill you do with software. We don't call it modding when you're actually modifying human relationships, emotional intelligence, and rules of play. But I actually think these are collapsing fast and that modern game designers, I mean, I believe this very strongly, uh, in the future will be designers first and foremost of social relationships and communities that learn. And the software will have to be a tool for that. Well, Spore is already there. Uh, you know, Spore got criticized as a game because I think people missed the fact that it was a tool for creativity. It wasn't supposed to be a strategy game like Rise of Nations. It was supposed to be a tool for creativity in which by playing, you designed, you played it by designing and then were immediately in a community of people who you'd given the stuff to and took from. So um, I don't think you're going to see games, commercial games or learning games where people have not designed a good a little g game and big g game and integrated them and that's a set of skills that not everybody has right i mean uh it's an, it's going to require the collaboration of multiple uh people uh you know what would world of warcraft be without its forums uh, you know it, to see to think that world of warcraft is just being inside the game and to leave out the forums in which people, for example, debate whole statistical models of how the game works and change the company because they steal it and, you know. So um, how this is working out, we don't know uh, uh, because people haven't studied it yet very much, right? You know, people actually, you know, you know, all the people who are trying to turn women into techies because they don't go to computer science anymore, always say, well, you know, women are good with social media and social media leads no place. They need to be, you know, take it, hacking their computer. Who said social media leads no? Go to South by Southwest if you want to know social media leads someplace. I mean, the interesting thing is, is that when women do it, we think it's soft. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm doing a book right now that I'm halfway through with my wife, Betty Hayes, on the women playing The Sims. So I'm impassioned about this. Because it seems to me that we have really ignored sets of skills that are really 21st century skills. Being able to use social media to organize groups, to spread your views, and to uh, mod in what I call emotional intelligence modding, that is to get people organized in ways that increases their emotional intelligence, is uh, really a profound skill. We only could have wished Bush had it. And uh, we live in a world in which everybody wants to compete by ch with China by getting better at algebra when we really need to get better at ethics and emotional intelligence around technology because we're destroying our world. So, um, and if we keep saying, well, they're the softies, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to miss where the action really is. Uh, it, that's, that's just an average. I mean, that's my view. And I, I, you know, and I feel bad because I never mentioned the Sims in my book. It was beneath my dignity to go look at the Sims. And every time you, you know, when you're a scholar, the thing that you think, you know, that's not worth looking at. Every time that's the thing you should have looked at. You always kick yourself and said, the assumption nothing is happening there is always wrong, right? All right, thank you.